All right, welcome to another episode of the Nature Journal Show. Today, we are going to be continuing the theme of Inktober and also continuing the theme of practicing from the Law's Guide to Nature Drawing and Journaling. So today, we are going to do something that I think a lot of us probably could use some practice at, and that is some of these hatching techniques and drawing three-dimensional objects. So this is page 270, um, starts on 270 in the Law's Guide to Nature Drawing and Journaling, basically the main book about nature journaling that all nature journaling beginners probably should look at. And a lot of us have this nature journaling book at home by John Muir Laws, but haven't done all of these exercises. And I just wanted to point out really quickly that in this book, things are sort of divided up in a way about like what subject, but also about tools. But at the beginning of the landscape section, so this is all about drawing and painting landscapes, pretty much on the second lesson, so this is the first lesson, which is a lot about sort of composition and size. On the very second lesson, it's about rocks, rocks, edges, and planes. And I know that does sound kind of boring, but um, getting this down is going to help all of your other landscape paintings. And in fact, it's going to help your drawing and painting of pretty much every subject or anything you do in nature journaling is getting these, these sort of volumetric tricks down. How can you make these three-dimensional objects? So we are going to be practicing some of that today. And I'm going to be using a fountain pen. This is one that Eli actually gave me. Thanks, Eli. Um, and I think I broke part of it when I dropped it on the ground, but it still uh, mostly works. I think I'm going to be using that and a Fude de Monin. Um, you could also be using a ballpoint pen would probably work fine for this. Um, and then I'm probably going to be using this pencil for um, some of the stuff. And I think we're going to try to get to this exercise here on page 272, 273. But we might just um, start with these basics here because I think these are really important. And one of the things is I love looking at how other artists use this and how I really suck at it. But look at the way these lines convey the dimensionality of these cliffs right here. This is something that I want to get better at and is not one of my strong points. And that's something that we're going to practice today. You can also look at Leonardo da Vinci's drawings um, and how he uses these marks to show dimension. And obviously, um, you know, John Muir Law has probably just made this up, made this rock up out of his imagination, but look at how well he did these lines um, to show this three dimensionality. So we're gonna practice with that. I think we'll just do a warm up with some of these. Um, go ahead and skip the, uh, what is that, a dodecahedron or I'm uh, one, two, three, I think it's maybe it's not, or maybe it's an octahedron. Uh, skip that one if that's too weird, that's a weird shape to draw. Try to at least do the cube. Um, what is that, a hexahedron, I think. Um, so let's let's start there and get sort of warmed up. Um, this was my Inktober sketch that I barely I barely fit the today's Inktober Nature Journal um, prompt in right before the show. I knew I had to do it before the show because it's going to be too dark to do a skyscape veto afterwards. Whoa! Wait a second. I could do a nighttime skyscape veto. Um, anyways, I squeeze that in. Oh, I also wanted to point out. Um, this new, just in case the Nature Journal show wasn't enough of a, a, a reason to eat more chocolate, this is another reason to eat more chocolate. So um, chocolate is supporting your immune health. So, I mean, you can't go wrong there. And I guess there's probiotic chocolate now. So um, I used to tell myself that I was getting these individually wrapped ones for teaching nature journaling. Um, and when I used to lead the Nature Journal Club in the North Bay, I would bring these and give them to people or I would use them in some of my classes. But I must point out that it's been about, because of COVID, it's been about two years since I've taught one of those classes, but I'm still buying um, the individually wrapped chocolates and I just kind of eat them myself while I'm nature journaling. And I highly recommend putting a couple of chocolates in your nature journaling kit or any candy. Now I put any, any kind of small sort of especially chocolate based candy inside of your nature journal kit somewhere where it won't melt is a really good thing to pull out um, 
you know, partway through your session because it's just like training an animal. So if you have a bigger nature journaling kit, you might be able to fit something like this. Um, or depending on what kind of pants you wear, you might have a pocket to fit something like this. And this would probably help with your nature journaling a lot more. Unfortunately, it is sort of hard to fit wine into most nature journaling kits. Um, but when you're nature journaling at home, it's really easy. Okay, enough about that. Let's jump in here. And I'm going to zoom down a little bit. So you don't have to see all of my chocolate um, and red wine that I'm consuming while I nature journal. Um, but um, let's jump in here. So I'm going to, I think I'm just going to do a couple of these um, cubes and I need to make sure I don't knock over. I did an ink wash for my uh, Inktober entry earlier, but um, I need to make sure I don't knock that over. So I'm going to start, maybe I'll do the pyramid too. That's probably good practice for me. And I think I'm just going to do this one here. So you can see here, he's got lines um, going in one direction. Pretty simple sort of hatching technique on one face of the pyramid and on two faces of the cube. If you're ever bored and don't have don't know what to draw on a page, this is the kind of, of thing you can do always is a good, really good exercise. And I know it might seem boring. Sometimes you might be like, oh my gosh, why would I do that? But maybe like you could do this while you're listening to your partner um, talk to you about different things and you're like, just maybe need something to do with your hands at that time. Or maybe that's a bad example. I was half joking with that one. Um, you probably shouldn't do these kinds of exercises while you're listening to your partner, even though studies have shown that doodling while listening, um, even if it's an unrelated subject that you're doodling about, oops, I lost the angle there, um, actually helps with retention. So you could just tell your partner to watch the TED Talk about that. Um, dang, I probably shouldn't have been talking while I was doing that. Um, anyways, actually, that's kind of close to what he did. All right, so moving on, I'm going to do this one. So these ones he's going sort of sideways and these ones he's going in the direction of the plane. So here he says, the line is the, here the line direction is down. The direction that a water drop on that surface would travel. I really like that. Um, I'm going to underline that and draw a water drop lit traveling down the surface on a couple of these. I think drawing inside. Oops, this is a library book. Shoot. Just kidding. This is not the library book. Thankfully, it's not. Okay. So on this next one, we're going to do it. See, this way the lines are just kind of going at a random angle. On the next one, let's do a pyramid. And let's make the lines going the way that water would travel. I'm actually just going to draw a droplet of water first. You might be able to do this kind of thing while you're watching a TV show or listening to the radio. Practice drawing three-dimensional objects with shading. So it looks like he's using the spacing and a little bit of increased pressure to, to make one darker than the other. That may or may not be possible with your ink tool. It looks like he's actually using a pencil tool. For some reason, mine never looks as cool as the one I'm copying. But it sort of looks like this one is a little bit darker than that one. So that's all that matters. Okay. Now let's go down here. Um, here are the hatched lines create a random texture across the surface, but change at each change in plane. So basically what he's saying is these, as you can see, are kind of going all different directions. These are going all different directions. And um, however they do at these planes change direction. Unlike these, which didn't change direction at every plane.
I'm going to raise the table a little bit to zoom in, pardon the sound. And then I'm going to do this one right here. Remember, this is just the warm up, so don't worry about it too much. Eat some chocolate and keep on trucking through. That's barely on the screen. Post in the comments if you have been um, trying to do Inktober this month and how has it been? What have you learned? What has been surprising or different than you expected? This random hashing is really hard for me for some reason. I probably shouldn't copy his, so don't necessarily copy his on this one. Look at it and then make your own random. But you can see his, it's basically going in random directions. So I'll imitate a few here with darker lines that you can see on the camera. It's basically going a bunch of random directions. Oh, Barbara is here. Hi, Barbara. Kate is here, Terry is here. A whole bunch of Patreon patrons are here tonight in the house. Thank you all so much. I was just at a Patreon um, seminar the day before yesterday. I try to, they put on these different classes and stuff to help um, Patreon creators uh, make better content and figure out how to make a sustainable livelihood from Patreon. And so I try to go to those as much as possible to learn new things. And the last one I went to was um, data scientists from Patreon talking about how to use page, how to use um, some of the tools on Patreon and how to, that uh, are based on data science and the data science team to make your Patreon content better and understand the needs of your Patreon membership. So that was really cool. All right, I'm trying these these sort of different hatching techniques here. This is one of the art practices that I've sort of targeted as one of my weak points. I'm going to just share. Um, I'm going to share. Uh, Kate and Eli's um, and Suzanne's content about um, Inktober. So this was the an answer to the question, um, are you doing Inktober? I like the idea of small ones. This was, this was a, basically a five minute, oh, I should write it down here. Five minute um, hashtag Inktober nature journal. So Suzanne's doing small ones. Um, Kate is also doing small ones. And then Eli has a good um, comment. And I think that, yeah, for some people, you know, I, I used to be hard on myself about this. And um, some people maybe actually are just, it's fine being sporadic and having like a huge amount of output and then not doing anything at all. And I recently listened to the um, Walter... Isaacson, I think it's two A's, um, biography of Leonardo da Vinci. Um, and in that biography, he did this cool job of pointing out that, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, Leonardo da Vinci, he like, he was such a failure in his, you know, follow through and Raphael was like, way, or no, Michelangelo was way harder working but um, in this biography, he was really kind of just trying to put a positive spin on the fact that Leonardo didn't finish a lot of paintings and projects instead of just being like, oh, how, you know, the world would have been so much better if he had just spent his time more efficiently and finished these projects. Um, 
So anyways, uh, thanks to Eli for that quote. Um, all right, uh, moving forward, I think that's all I'm going to do. It looks like this is sort of like a smudging shadow thing that he did with um, not with ink. Um, so I am going to go on to well, let's go on to the exercise here. So we're going to start with the exercise on page 271. If we get to the next page, that's fine. Otherwise, um, we'll be OK with it. So let's see here. Maybe I can put my um, stuff on this page here so you can see carving rocks. So um, if you have a rock at home, a pet rock, that'd be really great. Um, I looked around my house really quickly and I couldn't find any rocks to draw, um, but I found this thing and I realized that um, this brownie thing actually kind of looks like a rock. So if you don't have any rocks in your house, a brownie could, um, within sort of irregular surface, could work just as well. Um, and you can see here, um, John Muir Laws is working from his imagination. And just um, a reminder to everybody, this is from the Laws Guide to Nature Drawing and Journaling by our friend, our mentor, our fearless leader, John Muir Laws. And um, you can see here, he's just working from his imagination and making up all these different ways to carve it. So we have to remind ourselves at this point how much, um, you know, a formal practice of drawing and illustration he has done. So if you're not quite at this level, especially from your imagination, that is totally, totally fine. So um, what I'm going to do, it, he says here, play around, making a few studies, observing real rocks, even small ones, or a photo or something from your imagination. Use contour shading, um, line direction, to indicate the angles of the planes on the surface of a boulder. So what he's doing right now is what we did on this one. So this was the one where the water droplets are coming um, in the same line as our hatching. So if you imagine water dropping on it, um, which way they would go. So they would go this way. And that's what we're going to do with this rock. So let's go ahead and try to, I'm just going to try to copy his. Um, if you have, a, you know, one in front of you or a, a nice uneven brownie, you could use that as well. Um, post in the comments what other food items could work for this exercise if you don't have rocks sitting around your house. So I've got these two here um, and this giant boulder underneath. I'm going to copy his to the best of my ability. I noticed that a lot of times I don't pick my pen up enough and I end up with this sort of J mark at the end of my line. Oftentimes, maybe that's why I haven't gotten better at this technique. Okay, so I see he's got this line coming this different way, this plane underneath is going that way. For some reason, it's hard for me to visualize where these planes are without outlining them. I'm gonna raise the table a little bit more, zoom in a little bit more for you here. And adjust that. Hopefully that is actually easier to see. Okay, first chocolate break. This is one that Eli actually gave me on a recent, Kate was there, Ivea was there. Um, it was a recent nature journaling at night in the tide pools um, thing that we did, which was really cool. And Eli gave me this amazing chocolate I'm not sponsored by this brand. Mmm. It's kind of messy, but it is really good. Okay, so I'm going to put in the lines on the small one. One thing I recommend is if you don't like the way these kind of studies look, do more of them. If you think that one is ugly, make more of them. Because what happens is if you fill up a page with these small, not, you know, perfect, maybe ugly drawings, um, it actually looks cool just from the cumulative effect. So don't give up after one because you also get better when you do this a bunch of times. So if yours doesn't look like, if yours doesn't look like one of these right away, then that means you're a normal person. Um, if yours looks like, one of these right away, then maybe you have, um, you know, studied, spent a lot of time practicing art and um, that is really awesome and congratulations, but just don't judge yourself too harshly if yours doesn't look like the one in the book right away. 
So I'm going to do another one. He's shaded them slightly differently here. So um, I'll read what he says. As you run your eye along the boundary between light and shadow, you will see fingers of light intrude into the shadow and likewise shadow into the light. Include these perturbations and the quality of the shadow edge will dramatically improve. So here he has this sort of like simplified version and here he goes more into um, uh, more into a complex kind of version of it. So it's going to be even harder than the last one. But one of the main things that I'm noticing um, and I might sort of focus in on is that for this plane, it is um, a lot lighter and he's achieved that by putting spacing the lines out more. So this is something you could practice forever too, but closer spacing versus wider spacing will produce um, is one way to produce uh, different values. So this would be one would be my darkest, two would be my middle, and three would be my second to lightest, and four would be like that. So let's try that on this one. Maybe you're already ahead of me. Maybe you're practicing from um, a rock or a brownie that you have in front of you. Oh, those turn into these ones weird okay mine's gonna look completely different from him i'm afraid I feel like for me it's way easier I, I in my mind i want to put outlines around these different like planes you know but the idea of kind of just drawing them and building them up from these shapes instead of from the outlines is really challenging for my imagination Ooh, cindy great idea potatoes you could probably create an amazing boulder arrangement with potatoes that are in your kitchen right now that is genius and if you put like an extreme light on them um like if it were at night and you cast you took a lamp and like put it on one side only you could probably get some really cool shadows on a potato and practice that this technique that would probably be more in general practicing Practicing from life is better than just copying straight from a drawing of someone else. Um, so that would probably in a lot of ways be like more beneficial than what I'm doing right now. Um, so thank you for sharing that idea, Cindy. That's cool. Okay, let's um, keep going here and try this one, one more. Um, he says, by changing the shapes and angles of the shading lines, you can carve many different rock shapes. How can you suggest more complex rock shapes, including ledges and overhangs? Experiment, see what happens when you play around, but always come back to observing real sunlight on real rocks. That's See, that's exactly what I was saying, is you can learn way more by observing real rocks with real sunlight. So um, you will learn more um, when you're actually observing in the field and doing this, but for now we're practicing from the book. So we're going to try to copy his again. Maybe he wasn't making this up from his imagination. Maybe he was actually looking at some boulders in um, the Sierra Nevada or something for these sketches. So I see this um, area up here. You can see his also is matching with where there's these changes in the outline so there is a change in the outline of the rock right there and you can see the um the uh edges um the shadow matching that Ooh, here's another great one from kate rudder that is genius i want to do the um sort of renaissance thing of like taking fabric and dipping it into plaster i think it is or gesso or plaster a thin plaster and then draping the fabric over 
um, armatures. And then as the fabric uh, with the plaster dries, it like freezes into those folds and you can then practice drawing it with different shadows on it. Uh, crumpled paper sounds awesome. You could probably do like a paper mache thing. Um, so it, it stays in one position. I guess um, crumpled paper probably stays pretty, it probably doesn't change the way fabric can as much. Um, and you could draw it over and over. Okay, moving onwards. We're still in the pretty early stages of this. So I'm just going to kind of copy from his here. Uh, it looks like there is this shape here. I wonder if you could just go to a rock climbing gym and draw the rocks, the fake rocks. So here I really noticed that he's got these highlights and these sort of circular areas. And if I was using my pencil or even if I were using my pen kind of lightly, I think I would make circles around those. So those are the light spots. And now I'm going to come in and draw. See, my brain thinks way better around the highlights like that than around the negative shapes. And so then on this one, let's see, the highlight would be kind of like this and a little bit right here. That one kind of looks more like coral. Okay, so now I'm just gonna start adding some of this stuff that he's talking about here. Um, the outline should correspond to shadows and highlights within the rock. A dark object in the background makes light rock edges stand out. Ooh, that's a cool one. So see here how he's left this light edge there. So um, I'm gonna look for one here that I already have that on and just sort of add some more hatching to make it a little bit darker. This is the kind of work that in my usual nature journaling, this work is being done by my watercolor. So I use watercolor for managing my values and stuff. And I think partly because of that, I haven't gotten as good with these sort of techniques, but I would like to get a little bit better. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a dark sort of vegetation here to show that there is this um, kind of white highlight around the edge of the rock here. some kind of like agave. And I think this should like, to be legit, should probably come more close to there. And this should all be done already. Okay, and then he's darkening um, this sort of inside shadow part. Um, let's see what we could use on this one, a corresponding Part could be like here, uh, maybe like here also. And notice how I'm not like really using any intentional directionality for that part. I think that kind of worked. Okay, now that's grounding our rock. So um, I'm gonna pretend like this line is not here and take that away and ground my rock, he says, with a dark shadow. That's if there's not like some ridge right up to it. You can see there how he used that. I'll do that with the other one as well. So that makes it look like it's on something, whereas this one definitely, this one looks like it's floating, kind of like a cupcake. Um, this one looks like it's actually on the ground. And um, that's what he's doing here. Um, He's also drawing these cracks, which uh, let's try to we'll try to do that next. So let's try to add some cracks to this rock we're on. Okay, that looks pretty bad, but 
just going to flow with it. If they match with something on the outline that's crack like, that is a benefit. All right, cool. Um, let's see, I think that's a good warm up, enough warm up, and I think we have time to do this exercise here. So let's just jump into this so that we actually can try to build something up. Um, I recommend either doing a very small one or using something that's like a fat pin um, to uh, not end up spinning forever on this exercise. So let me get a new page here. We don't need that. It's definitely time for some more probiotic chocolate. I'm pretty sure that this will protect you from all diseases. It said on the thing that it's supporting your immune health. But, you know, I shop at Grocery Outlet, so it's kind of like whatever is the type of chocolate that they have at that time, that's going to be the type of chocolate that I get. Okay, step number one, we're actually starting with a pencil. So we're going to block in the shape. So I'm going to try to make mine not too big. There's this sort of smaller boulder underneath. It doesn't close in the side. This curves out more than I thought, and it curves out further this way. In fact, it curves out like right at the end here. Dips in a little bit, angles up. Then it's smoother than what I drew, a little bit shorter than that, and it rounds, then it's down, and then it's a point again. Then it goes out a little bit. Then it angles down to the left, and then it comes down comes up this one's coming down down there's like a little opening here opening here with the smaller roundish even smaller than that roundish rock talking to yourself is a really great thing to do and nature journaling makes talking to yourself socially acceptable again so you might as well and it scientifically proven to help your observation so while you're drawing something talk to yourself um your significant other will appreciate you and your nature journaling practice all the more if you get in the habit of just talking to yourself while you are drawing okay it really worked so talking to myself helped me through that but one thing I didn't get is he's got the blue pencil here. You might not be able to see this, but I'm going to draw on a couple of these planes, um, at least the top planes, um, I think, are really important. And he, see, he, this is the part that I can't do in my brain is um, draw these lines without having these lines that I'm about to draw right now. So, like, I get this part. Like, this makes this makes more sense to me. What I'm drawing now, what I don't get is these uh, without those outlines. That is the part that is like way harder for me to understand. So I'm drawing in this outline, so hopefully that you can see them um, there. And those were all in his uh, blue colored pencil, which I actually order. I'm about to order some of on Amazon because I'm such a bad um, protege of John Muir Laws because I hardly ever use the blue pencil. Post in the comments if you use non-photo blue pencil or if you don't and how how you feel about yourself because of that. Are you hard on yourself because you think like you should be using the blue, the non-photo blue pencil because John Muir Laws uses it? Or are you kind of like secretly love that fact that you don't use the non-photo blue pencil? Or um, do you use the non-photo blue pencil all the time and love it? Okay, draw the outlines of the major rocks, paying attention to where they overlap. Look for the angles along the edge to avoid over-rounding the rocks. Yes, some rocks really are rounded, but take a close look, and you'll often find angles to strong inflection points in the curves. Okay, so now I'm going to switch to my ink. 
Oh, Eli has a whole box full. Okay, I'm going to take that off my Amazon order right now. Debbie does not use um, the non-photo blue. Suzanne doesn't use it either because it's hard to see. Kate Rudder uh, does. Interesting. Jean doesn't. Oh, wow. I'm so glad that I asked this question. It's really interesting to see um, who is using the non-photo blue pencil. Interesting. Okay, cool. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Now let's, okay, we're going to switch to ink now here. And I think I'm going to, I, I think I'll stick with this um, platinum preppy that Eli gave me. Um, and I'll just try to make it quick and not spend forever on these. So what I want to do is basically what I did in pencil already um, is get this outline. Actually, I'm going to do the outline part with this. And I'm going to try to get this with a little bit of line variation. I'm not focused on the hatching right now. I'm focused on the outline, which I think is what I naturally kind of see things as outlines more. Um, and I think a lot of people's visual systems are more set up for outlines. And today we're we're trying not to overly focus on outlines, but um, get into the hatching. However, I will do a little bit of fun outlining here um, with my Fude de Manin. Now it looks like I did more drawing on more accurate drawing of it on this one than I did on my actual paper. That's fine. There's like a little V up here. And then I'll do the hatching with the pin that Eli gave me. Okay, so this looks like it. Oh, I see. That's going to all be dark there. And this is an outline here. So whichever ink tool you're using, go ahead and use that to kind of get in this step number two. And remember, line variation is good. So if you have too much control over the ink tool that you're using, you might not get line variation and you might get this sort of like scratchy line. Luckily with drawing rocks, there's a lot of leeway compared to drawing someone's face. So it's okay if I like mess up some of the proportions a little bit. It's it's more important that I get some like energy in, in my line work. And that's something that's hard for me usually, but I'm trying to get better at. Okay, I think that's good for my outline going to eat some more chocolate and then jump in with my next ink tool. Starting to get lots of ink stains on my table. Big surprise. Okay, so um, I guess technically this is step number two still. Follow the changing planes on the rock surface with changes in the angle of your pencil strokes. Whoops, well we're not using pencil, but um, what we're going to try to do is change the angle of our strokes to match the angles of the rock. So I'm going to start over here on the left side. And I've got this plane that I sort of outlined here, um, this outline, but it doesn't really match that. So I'll just go off of his. And I'll try to be more systematic. I think usually I go too fast with this. And that's why my lines don't actually look that good. Maybe I'm just not patient enough to do this kind of technique. How patient or impatient are you with your normal art techniques? Is this slow, very deliberate, repetitious, thousands of lines technique sort of your inherent style or is this sort of a challenge for you? Okay, so those are those lines. Now I'm gonna go up here. These are practically coming straight down. I'm gonna to try to be like really consistent. I usually wanna do these very fast.
See, I, I went really fast and the edges are all kind of weird. Oh, Eli is the most impatient person. What is Mr. Eraser? Oh, Anietta is here. Okay, it sounds like everyone else is just like me and likes to work faster and is not patient with these like crazy. Oh, look, he adds that in later. What a little sneaker. Okay, I'm going to add that in now because I was wondering about what's going on there and it's weird to me to not add it in. So I'm going to try to be patient and like actually in my line so that I don't end up with these weird J hooks at the bottom of each hatch line. It's amazing how challenging it is to actually slow down and do that. And then I'm going to try to strengthen these ones or lengthen them. Gosh, mine always end up with this weird little J. Not always. They often end up with that. See how at the bottom I'm hooking it back up a little bit. Wow, I have not heard of that eraser. Okay, I think it might be time to like go for the Death Star level of um, chocolate because all of this other chocolate was just like not not quite enough. So gonna have to go and take out the big guns and have some of this uh, brownie, I think. Hopefully you have some snacks at home and aren't getting uh, the sort of snack envy because it's fine if you don't have a rock at home, as long as you have something like that that you could draw. Look, it's totally like a rock. We could just, I wish I could see how John Muir Laws would draw this right now. Probably like maybe with stippling, like, D -d 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 -d. and then you could get the jumbo correction pin and uh, use it there for the highlights. Look at that. Okay, Eli's comment is still up there. I should probably put that away now. Oh my god, that is really dry. Mm -mm. Not good. Oh my god. I should have. It's vegan, not the problem. Oh my god. It might be a minute before I can talk again. The chocolate is way, way, way dry. Alright, so now I'm going to do these lines right here. I'm going to make them really long so they come all the way down to like this edge right here. Oh my gosh, it's chocolate. I asked a person working at the coffee shop if they had ever tried this, tried this before. And she said, yeah, it's pretty good for a vegan gluten-free thing. I probably should have been like, uh, okay, that means it's bad. But it's like... I don't feel like you need gluten to make like a good brownie. You don't need gluten and you don't really need butter. I feel like even with coconut oil, you can make a really good brownie. This is not a really good brownie. I almost died biting into this. Probably need like a gallon of milk or another glass of red wine to wash that down. So I'm working really, really hard here to be consistent and patient. Okay, now, ooh, yes, Eli, that is a great exercise. I have chocolate crumbs everywhere. Wow, that really, really tested my mouth's ability to create large amounts of mucus in a short amount of time because otherwise I would not have been able to swallow that and geez that was a close call okay so that one's slightly more angled this looks like it's even more angled this way and also slightly more spaced out all the way to like here and then maybe they start coming in this way closer together 
gosh, I probably just need to practice this like every single day. Okay, now on this one, we've got a little bit going this way and then they change direction, so. And then they come in this way and a little bit darker. And then from this side, also close together and darker. I feel like with pencil, you might be able to get a little bit more line variation. Okay, now I'm gonna come in here. This one's coming out from here, pretty dark. Oops, I'm getting that J hook again, so try to keep it steady and lift it up. I need to not be so lazy when I, I'm lazy when I lift my pin up. Like I don't lift it up off the paper straight up and then it ends up dragging and making this weird J mark. Okay, so this should come up to a point. And then there's another one coming up this way, starting from a point. So a lot of you that are watching right now and commenting during during the chat um, are patrons um, on Patreon, which is awesome because that totally helps me make these videos twice a week. And um, we have a patron-only party coming up really soon for Halloween, which I'm super excited about. I think I'm going to be Leonardo da Vinci for Halloween. Okay, so now um, let's see what he says next. Number three, squint at the boulders to help you see the contrast between light and shadow. Indicate the shadow areas with lines that conform to the contours of the rocks. For purposes of demonstration, I have emphasized this with clear, broad lines. Clear, broad lines. On a more careful illustration, these shadow areas might be smoother areas of tone with only a hint of the directionality of the lines. Oh, I see. However, even in a carefully shaded drawing, I still look for the crisp shades that are often formed by light and shadow instead of creating a smooth blend between the two. So this is, um, this right here is a star. This is the often forgotten, speaking of Leonardo da Vinci, um, a lot of people have heard of, uh, what's it called? Char oh shoot, now I'm gonna forget the name. Charoscuro, I think which is the method he uses where he like smooths the edges, but then he also has, um, there's another one that he does that is actually emphasizing the extreme between light and dark. So right here, uh, maybe like, you know, when you're um, early on in, in, in studying art, you might learn how to kind of make this very gradual transition between lights and darks, and then you start doing that everywhere. Um, but in fact, sometimes it's really useful to have this stark contrast between light and dark. And I think that's something that, for example, um, Mark Simmons um, talked about, or people who use ink often talk about having that stark contrast. Um, so I don't really see how much more he's adding to it since what we did on the last one. I guess these two, are sort of new shadows along vertical planes form dark wedges into the highlight areas. So I guess he's adding these um, things that come out into the highlight areas. So let's go ahead and add one here, which would match this one and make it sort of like a pointy wedge, hopefully. Um, this one is a wedge. Oh no, now I started doing this thing where I add like lines in between the lines. There's a couple on this boulder down here. Horizontal strokes suggest a horizontal surface. So he's adding some lines on these rocks, even though they're like the highlight part to suggest that they're a horizontal surface. So put some really light lines just going horizontally there. God, that kind of looks terrible, but on mine at least. Uh... Now I feel like I need to make these other things darker a little bit.
it's hard once you've done the really evenly spaced lines to go in there and actually make it darker without just kind of ruining everything. But I'm playing on the dangerous side right now. Adding hatching on top of hatching. You never know how it's going to work. Make this a little bit darker too. You could also, if you wanted to cheat, you could use a wash. A wash is how I would normally deal with all of these values. I feel like water with watercolor, I could have created these value distinctions in like uh, 30 seconds that have, oh shoot, dang, I just actually made a mark there. And with watercolor, I could have done this in like 30 seconds, maybe a minute. Oh, well, you know, if I did it in washes, maybe it would take, you know, five minutes, but it's taken me like 20 minutes to do them uh, with ink by hand. Nevertheless, I think this is a good practice. Oh, we have to keep going. All right, I thought we were done. I was like, oh yes, we're done. Okay, but there are actually way more things to do right here. And one of those things is not gonna be eating any more of this because it was just desiccated and drying my mouth out like the Sahara Desert. Okay, so I'm gonna slide over here. Let's see, okay, avo avoid adding detail to the background boulder. Okay, so this is the furthest back one. Don't add any detail to that. Oh no, he's adding cracks. This is gonna be hard. Now the cracks. Observe the way that cracks on the surface change direction where they cross from one plane to another. Depicting this is another powerful way of describing changes in the surface planes. Okay, so the cracks often occur where the planes change. So I don't, let's see, there's planes changing here. And then I guess there's planes changing there. Um, and then there's something, oh, this is a, I don't, I didn't realize the planes changed there. Oh, okay. So the cracks go sort of around this bump here, down to there and up here, down here, across here. That makes sense. Okay, and then they come around this and then they go up that way. Whoa, okay, that sucks. Oh, dang, I totally ruined that. All right, that's fine. This crack keeps going through the highlighted area here all the way down to this weird bit there down and it's darker there at the bottom. Okay, I can deal with that. Um, this one has like a smaller one here in between. Oops, my shading doesn't line up with it the way his does. Dang it. Well, okay. This is like that. This has a crack. Oh, it has an extra crack with some lines here. And then it comes down and then it goes, changes direction here. Oh, it should be like that. Um, and then it goes away. This one comes up here around the highlight to the side, across the highlight this way, a little triangle shape there. And I'll complete that one. Coming down this way, down, really dark spot, and a little thing here. Down. Next time we'll do this in the field from ro rocks that we're observing ourselves but sometimes it is good to practice and just kind of see if you can copy someone else's um, life drawing this way. Or not life, but rock drawing. Punch in a dark accent where two cracks meet. This, this rounds the sharp point of the rock section between the cracks where it is more vulnerable to erosion. Oh, interesting. So in these places where there's Vs, go ahead and make those bigger. Remember, don't add details to this one back here. Part of the atmospheric perspective. That curve looks really weird. I think that's when I dropped my pen. Add a suggestion of texture to the sunlit rock face. A few little hatched irregular lines and dots will do the trick. A little goes a long way, so do not overdo it. Maximize texture on faces receiving partial, aka glancing light, and along the boundaries between light and shadow. Leave the highlight areas blank. Okay, 
So he's using, a, you can see how he's doing this here. He's using a pencil, so that's easier for him. But go ahead and just make a couple like marks. Um, don't do too much in these, um, you know, main highlight areas. Maybe you can smudge something. This could be a good time to experiment with smudging. But like he said, a little bit goes a long way. So don't um, get too crazy or else you're going to mess things up. If you're using ink, uh, try not to make it too over patterned. Our tendency as humans is to make things more regular and more patterned and to see patterns where there are none. Okay, now I'm going to add in this sort of grass stuff. I'm going to use the food aid demo in for that. Oh, look, he added in a bird for scale. That's super cute. Food aid demo in is perfect for this. I love it. probably easily overdo this part as well. I'm going to try really hard not to because it's super fun. Oh my God, that's so fun. That's like the funnest part of the whole thing. All right, more chocolate. I deserved it. I'm going to eat. I'm going to eat some of this. Wait. Oh shoot, the chocolate turned the light down. I'm going to eat this one right here. It seems like it wasn't fully closed at the store, but I decided it's probably still safe. Um, this is pretty good for 95%. Um, it's pretty good. Pretty smooth. And I think it was at grocery outlet for like $1.99. So come on. So some chocolate, will, when you break it like that, it will sprinkle little flecks of chocolate on your paper. So I just want to point that out real quick. If you've ever had these like strange brown marks on your paper and not been sure what they are, it could be small pieces of chocolate like that. Oh my goodness, look at that. It's like a shooting star. Um, I have a whole uh, nature journal that's just full of these because I was going back and working on my pages at home after I got home from Tanzania. And there's these little chocolate flecks everywhere in that entire book because I was eating so much chocolate while I did it. So that may or may not be something that you want, especially if you're really precious about the drawings. That's why I recommend developing a fault tolerant style where your nature journaling style is not going to be, your page is not going to be ruined if you have two um, chocolate smudges on your page. Because that would be really sad to not eat chocolate because you're worried that it's going to mess up your whole nature journal page. That, that's not that's not the way to you know like live your life okay so I got that I'm gonna add a little bit of dark spots um, um, here I think some of my patreon patrons this month are gonna be getting some stickers and like I think mugs might be coming next month but um, I'm really excited about that I was supposed to order some to see what they looked like first but I didn't it it I didn't get around to it. So I actually don't know what these stickers they're produced through Patreon. I created the designs, um, did a sort of survey on Patreon to see what people liked best um, from my Patreon supporters. And um, then I ordered I set them up to be automatically delivered once people have been patrons for a certain amount of time. So I'm really excited to to hear from um, people. I think Akshay and Ivea might be the ones that are getting those um, first. Okay. Oh, Eli got a sticker. Awesome. How was it? I, I should probably order them. So actually, I hope it's not like low quality or something. Okay, now I'm going to add in this bird. Ooh, I like number eight. Step number eight is really good. I can't wait to get to step number eight. Step number eight is really hard though, according to John Muir Laws. Add in your little bird. If you want, add a Velociraptor, um, that would be fine. Okay, cool, so where we're at now is step number eight and he says, now the hard part, stop drawing. It is so much fun punching in dark cracks and adding texture that you will easily overdo it. Quit while you are still ahead. So I feel pretty good about this. We did do a, um, oh, I should write, uh, I should point out, 
do write down, um, you know, I, for me, I'll just write JML um, guide, John Muir Law's guide, and it's page 272, 273. It's really good to at least this is basically like your metadata when you are uh, nature journaling from another book. So um, this one's from my window, so I'm not going to put the metadata there. But down here, I will write um, JML. And this was pages. We started with um, pages 270 and 271. So as long as you have that, that's basically counts as your metadata. If I feel good. I did this ink wash for Inktober. I did this um, study right now for the Nature Journal show. Um, and that was good. I ate a bunch of chocolate. I almost died eating this um, way overly dry. Um, I'm going to go back to the coffee shop and complain. Actually, maybe I won't. My worms will, and my worm bin will probably love that. Um, thank you for joining in. Thank you, all of you who are supporting me on Patreon. It's it's really helpful just to let you all know right now I'm doing a bunch of sort of like manual labor work um, to help pay the bills. Otherwise, I have been full time for a year doing the nature journaling education, um, which is my dream and my vision to do that full time. So thank you to all of you who support me on Patreon. Um, that is like one of the best ways that, that you can support me and for tuning in and, and you know, liking the videos, um, posting the comment, all of those things help a lot. And our next show is going to be coming out on Sunday. I think I'm going to be nature journaling a pumpkin or I might be interviewing Rebecca Rolnick um, or interviewing someone else. So it's still a mystery what we're going to be doing um, this Sunday at 1 p.m. But I'll see you next week. Um, on Wednesday at 6 p.m. or this Sunday at 1 p.m. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Bye.